Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, bringing together prominent New Yorkers with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. New Yorkers go to the polls this year to choose a governor, with Republican George Pataki running for a third term. The two leading Democrats, Comptroller H. Carl McCall and former Federal Housing Secretary Andrew Cuomo, are running a spirited, if sometimes nasty, primary battle for the right to face Pataki. And since what would be an election these days without a billionaire, Rochester businessman Thomas Galasano is readying his third bid for the job as a member of the, of the Independence Party he created, or as a true independent if the party he formed backs Pataki. We're joined tonight by four veteran political watchers. Maurice Carroll, who everybody knows as Mickey, went from writing about politics to serving as the key journalistic interpreter of the widely respected Quinnipiac University polls. Joe Mercurio, who heads National Political Services, is a campaign consultant who is rare in his business for actually handling both Democratic and Republican campaigns. Angelo Falcone directs the, directs the Institute for Puerto Rican Policy affiliated with the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. And Beth Harpaz is a political reporter for the Associated Press whose recent book, The Girls in the Van, recounted the sometimes hilarious and sometimes grinding assignment of covering former First Lady Hillary Clinton's successful campaign to become New York's junior United States Senator. Beth, let me, uh, let me begin with you. In uh, reading your book, Hillary took, um, took some lessons from Chuck Schumer in 1998 in terms of running upstate, focusing upstate. Here you have two essentially city Democrats running against Pataki. Should they be taking a page from Hillary who took a page from Schumer? Absolutely. And, and Hillary took it a step further than Schumer. I mean, her listening tour, which, you know, we made a lot of fun of it, especially the downstate media. I think we didn't quite get it. But uh, when she spent a lot of time upstate, even in Republican areas, she went to small towns, rural areas, places that that had, number one, been left behind by the political establishment, uh, ignored, you know, famous people don't go to little towns like Penyan and the Finger Lakes, and Hillary went there more than once. Uh, and, and also places that were really left out of the economic boom of the 90s, places that have been in an economic depression for a long time. Hillary went there and talked about the economy. We called that issue the stealth bomber of the U.S. Senate campaign. Her Republican opponent, opponent Rick Lazio, made fun of that as an issue and, and tried to, uh, as Hillary said, he put happy talk on it. He, he pretended like the upstate economy wasn't a problem. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, it is the one issue that the Democrats could use against Governor Pataki. Uh, I'm not really sure how else they're going to appeal uh, to New Yorkers. It's the one area that I see where he's terribly vulnerable. Uh, and if they want to take a page from what Hillary did and really spend a lot of time up there in places that, you know, are still suffering or suffering again, um, you know, from the, the downturn in the economy, I think they could probably, you know, make some inroads and, and maybe, you know, maybe get some votes. You know, what Democrats have had success reaching into traditionally Republican areas, Angelo, now the governor is making a full bore effort to reach into Democratic constituencies, Latinos, the union movement. Um, do we have three Democrats in this race? Well, yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of like a, a lot of continuity with the election in New York City last year. Uh, when you look at uh, the Bloomberg administration and the kind of people that have come in, uh, it's, it's hard to tell ideologically what the hell's going on in terms of a Republican governor with all these Democrats around them, liberal Democrats, uh, a few communists, I guess. And, uh, you know, the same thing's happening, I think, with the governor at, at a certain level. Uh, I don't think he's going to go quite as far because, uh, you know, he has a different kind of constituency than a Bloomberg. But uh, it's been interesting, the inroads I think he's going to be making, and has been making in the Latino community. Uh, I think he's not going to make the same kind of inroads in the black community because they have a more maybe traditionally democratic uh, po political uh, leadership. But uh, it's been interesting the way he's been, been moving and the kinds of initiatives he's been uh, making, even on the issue of re political redistricting. Thing. You know, he championed a, a Hispanic district in the state senate, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, he got some Bruno to recount the number of Dominicans, uh, you know, which I didn't know Bruno could count that high, but he, he was able to get him to do that. So it's been interesting. And this whole thing with Dennis Rivera, I mean, Dennis Rivera has gotten a lot of flack for backing, uh, the, you know, Pataki, uh, but then it reflects, you know, some real horse trading and some real uh, reaching out to, to constituencies that in the past Republicans just paid lip service to. Mickey, Pataki has obviously a clear run to the Republican nomination, but the Democrats are kind of both knocking each other around and trying to take some shots at Pataki. Assess the primary, and uh, the most kind of dramatic thing was Andrew Cuomo calling Pataki a coat holder in the aftermath of September 11th. I mean, uh, well, assess you know, what's going on. The Quinnipiac numbers, if you just looked at the numbers without a name on them, you'd say, who is this Democrat? <laughs> the, the Dennis Rivera thing. 
Yeah, you all know about that, right? Dennis Rivera, leader of 1199, a, a minority union, well, <laughs> minority members, uh, came out for Pataki after he got how many zillion dollars for his That's members in that, that $2 special dollars budget. Basically, money in short, towards his workers. Uh, uh, Pataki's doing everything right. Uh, the Quinnipiac uh, poll, we were going to come down to New York City uh, uh, after our last visit to Albany, but the Andrew Cuomo thing about uh, Giuliani being the hero and Pataki just being his coat holder, we couldn't resist it. So we asked, and, and, and I, the line I couldn't resist was I said, you know, Pataki, or I'm sorry, Andrew Cuomo set out on a bus for Buffalo, but he wound up in the soup. He lost and lost big. And in, those, and, and and that's hurting him not only against Pataki but also against, well, but also against not McCall. as much against a little bit. That's you know, uh, McCall has a right to to feel you know, isn't there any justice in this world? Because you know what happened, Andrew Cuomo lost a little bit in the the Quinnipiac poll, and Carl McCall lost a little bit too. So Cuomo still wins in our measure, in the Quinnipiac measure, still wins the primary. Still, but Bud still loses to the governor. Oh yeah, they both lose. The governor eats him alive. Either of them. Joe, you've run a lot of campaigns. If you were handling the Democratic gubernatorial campaign, what kind of a what kind of a strategy would you craft? It's an well, uphill strategy. I, I, the, neither candidate has yet to give the public a rationale for their campaigns. Like, it's interesting that people are looking at at upstate uh, candidates very often. It's self fulfilling prophecies. They neglect areas like upstate New York, and then the Democrat doesn't do well. Well, upstate today. Uh, it's largely urban voters. Uh, a lot of the yeah. votes upstate come from cities. Cities have urban centers. There are a lot of blacks and Hispanics and immigrant populations in upstate cities. Uh, the rural vote has gotten smaller. Upstate New York has lost population. New York City's gained population. But the Democrats have been doing something in the last few years. There's a tendency for primaries to be white liberal Democrat versus minority candidate. Minority population's been getting bigger and bigger in the city and in the uh, in the Democratic primary. Uh, minority candidate loses to uh, liberal white candidate, and then in the general election, minority vote goes down or minority vote switches to opposition candidate. It looks like we could see that happening again. It's happened a number of times. And the Democrats haven't gotten any smarter in recent years. And yeah, what's the answer? Uh, well, <laughs> what do they I, do? I, you know, uh, <laughs> murder I, one of them. I, you know, <laughs> Andrew Cuomo seems to be looking towards. Well, I'm not going to talk about the primary. Yeah. I'm going to make believe I won the primary, and I'm going to talk yeah. about the general election. Uh, they they actually, from what I hear, did focus groups on whether or not to attack Pataki on leadership. But the way they did it, stumbling out almost accidentally, attacking the governor about carrying the real leader's coat, uh, was horrendous. And it, yeah. it, the fact that it happened the day your poll came out, Quinnipiac yeah. and Marist also had their poll coming out, showing Andrew Cuomo coming out a little ahead of uh, McCall, that story would have been Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning news programs. He walked all over his own news story with that. It wasn't done properly. He's a, a, a newbie candidate. He worked in his governor's campaigns helped his governor in the administration, but he was never his own candidate. And I think it it shows. It was a very sloppy candidate. Yeah, but you know, it's not a dumb thing to do necessarily. You know, I, I, the, the analogy I saw was like, a, in a foot, you're a football coach, right? And you're coming up against a team that really is good against the run. So what do you do? You run. Run well, at their strength know, instead of their weakness. It's it, not a stupid thing to do. It's what the coordinated Democratic yeah. Party was doing against Giuliani when yeah. he was yeah. running for the yeah. Senate and then let up on it after after he dropped out of the Senate race. Yeah. Conceivably, you could do that. The difference here, though, is that an awful lot of Democrats are supporting Pataki, well, and Pataki is and making Dennis a Rivera very being, conscious, yeah. and, 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 and Herb Berman is working in the campaign, and Kruger yeah. in, in Brooklyn is supporting the campaign, and there are lots of Hispanic and black leaders that are being curried. Yep. Uh, you could wind up having a situation where Andrew Cuomo stumbles in the primary against McCall, and Pataki really makes a move even on the black, I, I, I would say he could even make a move on the, on the black electorate. Yeah. It seems to be somewhat of an analogy almost to uh, Giuliani's 1997 re-election against Ruth Messenger, where there was no question that he was going to 
win, but he wanted to win by record numbers. And he poured it on, attacking her and attacking her. And his, because he believed he was going to absolutely win, his constituency was beyond the electorate. He wanted people in Washington to notice. I mean, to what degree is Pataki thinking that, you know... Uh, Thinking president, that, uh, vice president. Cheney like, is, yeah. that, that Cheney's going to get ill, going to yeah. be off the ticket. I mean, uh, to what degree is he trying to show as strong a vote as possible to get the attention of people in Washington? Well, That's I mean, it's you. no secret that, I mean, you know, Pataki's interested in, in national office. Uh, the thing, though, about Pataki that's interesting, he's, he's kind of like a, uh, a Mr. Suave, the way he kind of works you know, works it. He's, he's not like a kind of hard edge kind of guy, like, you know, a, a Giuliani type. And, and it's interesting, he's almost like he's walking through this thing. You Except know. that Giuliani's hard edge upset a lot of people. I'm yeah. watching my language. Upset a lot of people. Um, Pataki, that, that placid quality of him doesn't upset a lot of people. He's also he's very chameleon-like, and I think that's part of his brilliance as a politician. I mean, to his Republican base, he has been a fiscal conservative. And my husband is a legal aid lawyer, so I hear a lot about the criminal, criminal justice side of this. He's been very tough on crime in terms of, uh, you know, his policies regarding parole, regarding, uh, you know, jails, regarding uh, his appointments to, you know, to, to judgeships uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, on the other hand, he's a social liberal, which, you know, I think we were talking earlier about the Jewish vote, which tends to go where the, you know, where the social liberal is, and you're telling me that the Jewish vote is, is with Pataki. Yeah. Um, you know, gun control, abortion, those hot-button social issues, Pataki is, is very liberal on them. And frankly, I can't see the National Republican Party taking a governor from New York who is a social, as, as socially liberal as Pataki. That may be his dream and his ambition, and that may be what he's imagining in his head. I don't see it happening. No, I don't see it happening. Tom Ridge, and he was yeah. the, the the perfect choice for, for vice president. Seems to me. I, I think a lot of people misconstrue misconstrue his move to really service the uh, Hispanic community in New York, uh, very much the way Bush did in in Texas, and and the way California Republicans didn't, as an indication that he was looking towards national national office. I don't think it's that, uh, and I I think it's part of. Uh, he and and Giuliani also had it. Immigrant policies uh, and and liberal social policies have been something they've looked more favorably towards. And you look on the environmental issues. Right, He's Hudson out River. Thing. Doing Theodore Roosevelt on Absolutely. environmental issues in the state. <laughs> and, and that the Hudson River Agreement, I think a lot of New Yorkers who are moderate voters, uh, you know, this this uh, getting the Bush administration to agree to dredge the PCBs out of the Hudson River. I think a lot of New Yorkers say that would not have happened if George if George Pataki was not our governor, if he hadn't made that pitch to the Bush administration. And you know, a lot of people for whom environmentalism is is you know a defining issue on how they're going to vote. There aren't a lot of them, but there are some. Um, and a lot of those people live along the Hudson River. They live in Westchester. They live in Rockland County. Um, you know, they're going to look at that and they're going to say, if I don't vote for George Pataki now, if I don't reward a Republican for doing the right thing on this environmental issue that's so important to me, then how can I credibly ask Republicans to do the right thing on the environment if we don't give them our support now? Or, you know, if the environmental, if the environmental organizations don't either endorse him or sit this race out, then they may lose their credibility with, you know, with other Republican uh, politicians. He's also talking about talking about immigrants, and I want to come back to that point in a second. Talking about immigrants, there's an issue of concern to CUNY in particular on the uh, on, on whether non uh, whether whether undocumented uh, uh, students have to pay the in-state or out-of-state okay. tuition. And in fact, he's moved to uh, recast state law to kind of get around this federal prohibition of, against allowing uh, against allowing undocumented immigrants to pay the in the the uh, in-state tuition. Is that a is that, is that outreach resonating? Well, I, I think it is. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we issued a report, for example, on a lack of Latino judges. This is a national report, and we singled out New York. We leaked the report to a few people uh, two weeks uh, before we released it, and a week later he appoints two Hispanics to the appellate. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, you, you know, he spends a lot of time in the Caribbean. I mean, he's doing things that I think he see. Cause I, I think especially the vote last year in New York City showed that the Latino vote, for example, could shift in, in dramatic ways. Well, yeah, but that was a special case. Oh, no, they no, got but, sore but, but about the, point, the way Ferrer got treated. No, no, but, but I'm just saying the point yeah. is, though, that there, there, there was a school of thought that that was not impossible yeah. to, to yeah. Get, get that kind of... And, you know, in fact, when you see those kind of possibilities and you see him jumping on these kinds of things, uh, I think it, it makes it harder. And plus this lead that he has uh, also, you know, makes it palatable for a lot of politicians and people say, well, I'm going to back this guy, he's going to win. And uh, well, You know, Angel, gonna... that's, it, Archwood, the, the Quinnipiac numbers always show that, that 
Pataki does well among uh, Hispanic voters. The only, the, the most loyal Democrats are your black voters. They're still solidly Democratic, but, but uh, Hispanic voters are definitely up for grabs. You but know, clearly, what, clearly the black vote uh, has been in recent years solidly Democratic, oh, yeah. dependably so. But that's only since World War II, really. Well, geez, that's Before, a fairly long time, Joe. You know, but, but like the, half a century. The, the point that, well, you know, in, in, in Al Smith's first governor's race, yeah. they were surprised they got the, the Jewish vote yeah. up to 50%. Yeah. Votes change. Ethnic groups and, and minorities oh, change hey. positions. Yeah. And I think if you've got a governor like Pataki really servicing a community, oh, yeah, the votes yeah, yeah. are going to switch. And I think if, if Carl McCall gets mistreated ultimately in the primary by the Democrats and you've got a governor who's reaching out like he is to the Hispanic community to the black community uh, he's gonna get more votes in the black community and I think then you're gonna see him spending a lot more time after the election on the black community and in the future yeah, yeah, it's, it's not a, inconceivable the, yeah. that things change one of the problems in reaching out to Hispanics reaching out to the african-american community is he's getting pulled out, pulled back by the by the Mike Longs of the world and the conservative parties of the world. They're getting pulled back very far, Bob. I mean, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, but he has some, you know, he can't fly off to the left and lose a lot, you know, lose his conservative base. Yeah. They could argue they have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. They made the same argument about Hispanic Democrats in New York City with Freddie Ferrer. Ultimately, they're going to have yeah, nowhere else to go they're, except they're for Mark Green. They're not even and they looking mm. anywhere, <laughs> and they're not even complaining at this no, stage no, of the no, game. No, no, I mean, no. they are delighted that he's going to be winning by huge margins. Because uh, they've they've been working with him for eight years now, they've been comfortable with his policies. Uh, you know, the, the conservatives are more interested in this state in economic issues, and tax, and and budgetary issues, and government waste. And I think uh, the the conservatives here have never been really hard line. Even the conservative party itself. I mean, you got to remember we have a right to life party. Also, you know, the, the hardcore right to lifers aren't in the conservative party or in the Republican party, they're in the right to life party. Uh, the, you know, fiscal conservative matters, he's been, f from their point of view, he's been very good on. Now, one of the, now, it looks like Pataki's not gonna have a Republican primary, but he may no. have an Independence Party primary of all Well, it can, you know, I don't know. Is, 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 is Galasano registered in the Independent Party? Um, Galasano is, I'm not sure if he's registered. Because the law but says you was, can't run in, a, in, a, in another party unless the party so invites you in. I don't know that, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but Thomas Galasano. Doesn't that party belong to him? So, it, well, well, he, he, he formed it, it now started, but now it's not his anymore. It may belong yeah. to uh, Lenora Filani if you listen to some of the critics of well, the, the party. Her, her portion her, in Manhattan in, is in, has already endorsed Pataki. Has already endorsed yeah. Pataki, which is more bizarre than I. You know, I will tell you that as a, in my <laughs> that in my reporter days, the Galasano, I covered the Galasano campaign in 1994. It's the only campaign I ever flew around in a private jet. Uh, Tom Galasano, for those of you who don't know, is the is a billionaire. He runs a company called Paycheck. Uh, which is up in Rochester, and basically he made his fortune in automating payroll. I mean, so that everybody's, so that companies have him do their payroll and generate computer checks, and uh, kind of like, actually, which is how Ross Perot actually got got started yeah. as uh, on automated payroll stuff. And he has been Lundberg an antagonist. He, he, he has been antagonistic to Governor Pataki since 1994. Um, and has the potential to really give him a headache, or or what does he? I mean, he's got no more than eight percent of the vote. But I mean, what's your sense? You've been up and I mean, the way I see third-party candidates is they remind one of the two major parties of the extreme wing of their party. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I the, the function that I see Galasano having in this race is to remind the Republicans that hey, there are people out there that are a lot more conservative than George Pataki. Don't forget it. You know, I mean, I think that's what Nader did in, in the presidential race. I think that's a lot of reason why these people run. I think that's a lot of reason why people vote for them. It's just to say, hey, I'm here, don't forget me. But, I mean, make a real impact in the race. I don't, I don't see how he loses because Galasano takes away, you know, a single digits percent worth of the vote. Well, they, they did get enough votes to become the, the third line yeah. on the ballot. Uh, I wonder, and maybe Mickey could tell us, uh, here's another Italian candidate entering the race of Andrew Cuomo's, uh, the candidate Italians, Catholics are the largest ethnic groups in the, they are, in the yeah, state. Yeah. Uh, does this have any impact on Cuomo as a favorite son candidate in, uh, among Catholics and Italians? I would guess not, but I don't know. But the other question, of course, with Andrew Cuomo is the uh, Shakespearean quality of the son running against the guy who unseated the father. I mean, and. Uh, 
you know, we saw this somewhat when Adam Clayton Powell the fourth yeah. ran against uh, Charlie Rangel, who had unseated Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the congressman from Harlem. I mean, is there how much of the Hamlet? Is how much of Hamlet? Well, it's is not Shakespeare, but you know, look who's president. Yeah, you look who was, was president say, just a few right? years yeah, ago. Right. Right. The uh, yeah. that one. Uh, uh, but I'm just saying, it runs in families, I guess. Yeah. yeah, a lot of states have that kind of tradition. But I mean, I mean, how much of you know are the sins of the fathers being is are, are the sins of the fathers being visited on the son? That's interesting. We again, you can't believe, uh, you know, when you do a poll. There are some questions you sort of have to, you know, take a, a look at. We just, would the fact that Andrew Cuomo is Mario Cuomo's son make him more likely to vote for him or less likely? And I don't remember the exact numbers. A few more likely, a few more or less likely. Most people say it wouldn't make any difference. And I'm inclined to think that that's true. You know, he's his own guy. Hmm. Well, it depends on, uh, you know, uh, they're not engaged yet. I mean, you know, right now the, the, it's, a, you know, it's basically McCall versus, you know, Cuomo, once yeah. uh, you, you talk about a general election, it'll be interesting to see how Pataki kind of, you know, starts trying to make those connections and whether they resonate or not. I mean, it gives you a built-in credibility problem. I mean, Hillary faced this problem also, which <laughs> is that, you know, never run for elective office before, you know, never been elected yeah. to anything. You're kind of only here because you're related to somebody who did it the hard way, right? And so right out of the gate, the voters are wondering, is this just being handed to you because... You're related to someone with the same last name who actually ran for election and won. And, you and know, there's a Kennedy connection, too. To me. Right. Uh, true, because he's married to a Kennedy. Um, and, I mean, obviously it will be up to Pataki's people to kind of, you know, hit him with that and say, oh, he, he's never done anything. Uh, of course, it's not right. a sure thing that Andrew Cuomo is the candidate. Precisely. Carl right. McCall yeah. is a substantial public figure in yeah. New York. He's, uh, in the last... 15 years, I think only twice, once Cuomo and once Bob Abrams got more votes than he got statewide mm -hmm. in, in absolute numbers. Uh, you know, he's a very, very serious contender. I think the public polling uh, uh, is underestimating his strength because he's not yet getting the, f the full black support that I think he'll get on election day. Well, that's, yeah, that, and that's something, I, it was before I was a pollster, but I remember when, uh, at Newsday, Bob, when we were both there, we polled and we found something like 75, 80 percent of black New Yorkers said they were going to vote for Dinkins. It was ridiculous. About 98 percent of them voted right, for exactly. him. You know, so and that, and you're, and exactly. You're that now. Yes, exactly. I, I exactly. think the race is a lot closer. And in fact, Absolutely. after Andrew Cuomo's gaffe last week, I would bet that in reality, uh, Carl McCall is ahead. You know, at this uh, point uh, of a campaign, not no numbers, but that he he conceive of you know. Numbers fluctuate. Yeah. Of course, you know, all this discussion of who's going to vote where, that comes a lot further down the line than where we are today. I mean, today we're in the kind of ultimate retail politics of trying to line up particular leaders. We're, in, we're, we're still in the endorsement game. We're not in, uh, we're not in, you know, we're not in the kind of wholesale politics of TV advertising and stuff. Uh, how do you assess, uh, um, you know, you have county leaders going one way and their county organizations going the other way in the, in the Democratic primary. Uh, why is this important at this point in an election? Does it, does it tell us anything about issues? Does it tell us anything about policy, or is it purely... Issues, no. I mean, purely mm -hmm. pushing, and pushing and shoving. Well, it, it affects turnout later mm -hmm. uh, in various areas where they'll be strong or, or weak. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the turnout numbers in Democratic primaries, it's a relatively small vote when it comes down to it. Uh, and I, I think this year, especially in the primary, we might have a, a higher vote in the general election, but I think the primary is going to be lower than normal. Uh, local support in various places is going to make a tremendous difference, giving people a little bit of edge here and there. Uh, if they've got organizations that are going to turn out vote, uh, they could get the point or two extra that they need. And that's going to be particularly important, I think, for Carl McCall, and especially in the, uh, in the black community. He's got to really get out the vote. Well, Angelo, I'm curious about the Hispanic community. The Hispanic community in, in the Mark Green, uh, uh, Mike Bloomberg, uh, the Hispanic community as represented by the Bronx, by Ramon, uh, you know, they just stayed home. Uh, and, and, and that, as much as anything, probably delivered the thing to Bloomberg. What are the, you know, is anybody, what, what's going to happen up in the Bronx, which is the Puerto Rican well, I, I think the problem is in the Latino community, and as, as I think what's happening all over the place, it's just the, the, the kind of cues that uh, we're getting in our community from our leadership is all over the place. I mean, you know, it's like half the Latino elected officials are going with Pataki. Yeah. Uh, half, you know, they're all, almost all Democrats. Some are becoming Democrats, like Espada. 
Republicans. Republicans. Yeah, Republicans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Espada. And, and so what that does is it, it really makes it difficult for the Latino community sometimes to kind of focus and get excited because you're getting all sorts of mixed so what's gonna messages. Happen? Well, I think the turnout's going to be pretty low on this one. And I, I, I don't think people were going to be able to capitalize on all the talk about the impact of the Latino mm -hmm. vote mm -hmm. uh, because the impact of the Latino vote was actually on the basis of, you know, uh, at the end, the people not the turning Bloomberg, out to vote. Uh, the Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg at home. But also, yeah. Dennis Rivera is not Freddie Ferrer, and I mean, you know, uh, Freddie Ferrer as, as, as an elected official had a much broader appeal even than Dennis Rivera does, so I don't think there's... Yeah, but Dennis Rivera have, has telephones. Right, Dennis you, Rivera has right, mailing lists, right, you know. You don't uh, have the uh, kind of, uh, you know, well, one, uh, one of the Freddy, reasons why Freddy, 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 Bloomberg did better, partly because it wasn't just that he got a bigger percentage of the Hispanic vote, the, the Democratic partisan portion of the Hispanic vote didn't show up, right? So right, we got a right. bigger no, but percentage. The, uh, but the, I the think you're going to have the same thing happening with Pataki. If there's this kind of confusion among hardcore Democrats, hardcore partisan Hispanic Democrats will be lower turnout. That lower turnout's going to give Pataki a bigger percentage of it, and yeah. it's going to change yeah. the, the the proportion of the statewide vote that's New York City, which the Dem Democrats desperately need, is going to be smaller. Yeah, but and the, isn't the, the point primary on, uh, September 10th? Yeah. I mean, I think people will also have foremost in their minds the, that it's been a year since September 11th, and that which was the last, which was the first primary day, right? Yeah, and yeah. that that, well, that will be distracting to people. It will overwhelm the media in terms of an ability to focus on this, and Democrats who are thinking, okay, I'm going to vote for Pataki in the general election anyway. Why should I bother to turn out for this thing? That's a good point. I mean, I agree with that you also. that turnout except will be low, that, and I think that that could could make it. Except what happened last year with in the for rare green race is you had this overwhelming sense that there was a great amount of disrespect shown to, shown to with Freddie Ferrer. I don't think you have that as the kind of negative motivating. Well, you may, you know, you know, we, you know, the big, I mean, the big, the big question about the Democratic primary is how, how nasty it's going to get. And the closer it is, and it's pretty close, kind of would indicate this thing's going to get nasty. Well, and we're in the flux. I mean, you were yeah. talking about what, what's the significance of what's going on now. And I think part of the problem is that we're at a real crossroads in terms of ideologically, there are people all over the yeah. place, uh, the role of race in, 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 in American politics, in New York, in New York state politics. Uh, all over the place, people, the, the, you know, the relationship between blacks, Latinos, and the, the white liberal, uh, you know, kind of coalition, that, that's like really in flux. So those things are the, redefining themselves in a way that I think uh, 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 there's a lot of confusion, and I think a lot of voters just don't know what, what's what. You know, so you, when you talk about someone like a Pataki, you know, uh, being, seeming more like a Democrat than sometimes some of the Democrats, <laughs> I mean, right. that, that's kind of very interesting, and it, 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 it kind of reflects, uh, I think it's a sign of a, a, a broader trend in, in this society, uh, and a lot of, you know, I'm not sure where all this stuff is headed, uh, to be honest, at this point. You know, it wasn't as apparent in the, uh, uh, in the Giuliani race against Messinger, uh, but you had the si situation in the primary there as well, where she was running against the minority camp candidate, Al Sharpton, and that affected uh, the turnout also yeah. in, in her race. I mean, y y you know, it's not the Bloomberg uh, green race where the, the the margin was very close and that was the the, the the lower turnout was the decisive factor but you know we've done it a couple of times now in the city where you had messing liberal white candidate running against minority candidate affecting the ultimate race in uh, in the November election uh, if Carl has seemed to have been mistreated that could affect the turnout uh, well, mostly well, the, the black community but also the other side of it is McCall has never been you know, a black candidate. He's a candidate. He's a Democrat. He's never played, in, in my recollection, the, you know, I'm a black guy. And you well, he, doesn't, he doesn't have to. That's he, I know he doesn't. That's he, my goes, point. he goes to the black and Puerto He's, Rican caucus. Exactly. He goes to the, uh, the Hispanics, almost at Futuro yeah. Conference. Yeah. And he doesn't have to say anything. I mean, people yeah. identify with him that way. A lot of our and elected and officials. The talk shows will do yeah. it. Exactly. So, so what happens is I, I think that there is going to be that meaning is going to be there. I mean, I think yeah. he has the potential of, of being, not being simply seen as a black candidate. Exactly. With, with white voters. Exactly. But I think within minority communities, I think that there, there is going to be, there, people are watching very closely. Oh, all right. That's, a, you know, that's the other Side of it. Let me yeah. uh, go to go to some questions. Identify yourself. Speak up and tell us and tell us where you're from. Dan Weininger from Broken College. Um, I see two main points that the Democrats could really nail Pataki, and I don't see them doing it. One is that he basically toted the party line after September 11th with the boys in Washington, and did not hammer home any deal that really gave um, the funding that was really owed to New York City. Instead, <laughs> he backed off um, because the Bush administration wanted him to. Uh, McCall or Cuomo could attack him on that. 
And he's also named in a lawsuit in federal court dealing with redistricting. And I want to know how come, <clears throat> excuse me, the Democrats are not bringing that up in the sense that he deals with guys like Bruno in the state Senate, and he, uh, Bruno essentially makes it his business to disenfranchise minorities. Well, on the redistricting is that all these guys are in bed together, and they're all watching each other's backs on that one. So I think there's a conspiracy of, uh, you know, a silence on that because, you know, uh, the, the, the Democrats, you know, have their own deals. I mean, they kind of split up the, the two houses, and they're saying, look, do whatever the hell you want to do with yours, and, you know, if, you know, if the minorities are pissed off, maybe they'll take you to court and we'll deal with it that way. But I think that there's been that conspiracy. In terms of the issue of, you know, uh, his dealings with Washington, I mean, that's an issue that kind of came and went. And I'm not sure how you resuscitate something that's kind of already, I think, run its course to a certain extent. It'll be interesting to see, I think, if the Democratic candidates can kind of raise, you know, whoever the candidate is, can raise this. And, and you know, I mean, there, there are areas that, you know, Pataki is vulnerable. I mean, you know, in terms of upstate New York, you know, there's all the stuff about. Yeah, what's the issue? I mean, on the, the yeah, World Trade the, Center, he got the 20 billion you know, that he but, said. But, uh, <laughs> one of the issues was that in, his, that in the initial package that the state sent out to Washington, it was a $54 billion request. Yeah, yeah, that, that, was that, a, that, that, that was a train one of those, from that, you know, Utica. Right. I mean, it was a. But when it, it came to the, the real Christmas stuff, here. Bob, that they were talking they they. Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer said, we have $20 billion we need. Bush said, you got it. And as yeah. far as I can tell, they, they got it. They, they, they got the money, and they're probably between now and the election going to get more money. Yes. The, the point on the redistricting, it's not just Pataki in the suit. It's also the Assembly Democrats and the Senate Republicans. And Pataki was the one who made the legislature go back and vote again yeah. and, and create a Dominican district in, in Washington Heights. So I, I'm not sure Pataki's quite as vulnerable as as you would allege in the question. But you know, I think that there are things that he's vulnerable on and I'm not sure that they're being raised in an effective way. I mean, even the deal with uh, the health care workers union, there's a lot of one-time financial, dare right. I use the word gimmick, in, gimmicks in there. You know, I mean, the cigarette tax is one thing, but part of this would also be funded by a one-time uh, fee by the, the transformation of a health insurance corporation into some other kind of an entity and it would also depend on some money from Washington that might or might not come one time and I mean it's kind of like this thing is a sacred cow now they don't the Democrats for some reason don't dare say for some for reason, some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, this is what I don't get, okay? and maybe I'm being really <laughs> dense on this 1199 is already not endorsing them, so what do they have to lose by well, throwing right, 1199 is, every, 1199 other, is going to be every there. Every other race that a Democrat yeah. is yeah. running in. And not only uh, that, but they're not going to go away. This isn't a one-shot. I mean, 1199 I mean, I, it is It seems to me there's a way million. to do it, you know, criticizing the governor for one-time financial gimmicks, you know, that ultimately are going to be harmful to us in New York. You know, without sure. well, that, without that without argument, hurting without, Beth, without let me give you one, compromising your support for that me. That argument washes one, one, only if we're not in a in a disastrous yeah. economic condition that resulted out of 9/11. Going forward, uh, by the time the three years elapses where that gimmick is in place, the, the, the city mm -hmm. and the state theoretically are on rising revenue streams. So it's really not that much of a gimmick. It's to help us in a desperate time, and it's providing. Substantial health care. Yeah. And yeah. if, excuse me, just what the, if, you know, we ask, Quinnipiac asks regularly because we feel responsible. Isn't it awful? Don't you feel, Mr. and Mrs. New York, that this business about the legislature being late with the budget is a terrible thing? And everybody mm -hmm. says, yeah, it's a terrible thing. And then you know what happens? Nothing. <laughs> I have never known anybody to get voted out of office on a budgetary. Well, it was late when Cuomo was governor, too. Right? <laughs> yeah, both, exactly. Plus, when both parties come together and support things like that health package, yeah. it also blurs the lines. Right, sure. that's you know, true. So maybe what that's the true. state needs is a financial I guess as a citizen, I'm outraged yeah. over it. You know? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kathleen Gaspard from New York University. And my, co my question is for Mickey Carroll. Last year, during the... Primary, the Democratic primary, Quinnipiac poll showed Ferreira in the low teens, and inside his camp, they show and up until the end, but in the beginning and in the middle, and his camp showed always that he had the potential to reach 40 percent. This year, during the gubernatorial race, McCall is um, trailing Cuomo, while Strategic Moves came out and said that. Um, you mean the, why isn't our poll better? <laughs> or okay, or Good question. if there are claims that Quinnipiac undersamples yes. the minority community. No, we don't do that. Roberto know. Ramirez called me up after that, that one low poll, and he said, okay. Mickey, you're murdering us, and blah, 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 blah. And of course, we weren't murdering him. The numbers were murdering him. Okay. But Quinnipiac 
actually had the, I, I can't remember the exact thing, but basically, once we, that, that one bad poll, remember? There was a one week where, where we showed Ferrer at 14. I didn't like it, but hey, you know, uh, I always tell Doug Schwartz, our, our polling guy, our, our poll genius, who's terrific at this stuff, I said, Doug, one of these days we're going to absolutely, absolutely mess one up. So I think that was a bad week for us. But by and large, we measured uh, Ferrer pretty accurately. And that's why they hired Mickey, so he could fix stuff like that. Sorry. <laughs> no, we had one bad week. Hey, uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, hi. Aaron Painter, also from New York University. Um, you've spoken a lot about kind of the politics involved, and I was curious about some of the impact. Um, Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Pataki have developed a rather symbiotic relationship over the past several months. And without Pataki in the governor's mansion, some of Mayor Bloomberg's budgetary and lower Manhattan rebuilding initiatives could be in jeopardy. Um, I guess I was curious if you could both or all of you speak on uh, a little bit about the impact on New York City in a regional sense um, if Pataki were not to remain in the governor's mansion. Well, I, I, you know, a, a Democratic governor in, in the State House with a Democratic assembly and a Democratic city council in New York, and having gotten virtually all of their votes, the assumption would be that the Democrat would win because they did so well in the city. I can't imagine a Democratic governor not servicing New York City properly. It's, it's just not conceivable. The fact that Pataki has noticed that New York is here and is in need and he's reaching out the way he is, is almost a surprise. And he's going to probably get rewarded with extra votes for it. The question is, though, um, you know, one of the arguments is that we have a Republican president. This argument came out last, you know, well, last year in the Mesa. We have a Republican president. We have a Republican governor. Wouldn't it be better to have a Republican mayor so that they'll all so that they'll all get along? Yeah, but now you, you have the same Bloomberg's argument. No more Republican huh? than, than well, but he ran on yeah. the Republican yeah. line and he's raising a lot of money for Republicans and, and right. Republicans owe him yeah, yeah, for yeah. the kind of for the kind uh, of fundraising yeah. is and he and you know he now has if, a, you know he's hired if, if, he's hired some Republicans they don't yeah. they don't you know I got to tell you if, if, they did actually actually they didn't get many jobs under Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> well, if, if a Republican governor is setting a policy and a Republican mayor is setting a policy. Maybe those are Republican policies. Well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Well, except that, you know, I mean, the, for, I mean the, these guys aren't just triangulating. Well, in the rest of the country, <laughs> our, you know, our, you know, our Republicans are basically left with Democrats. <laughs> That's so right. There's also, you know, so we're a little bit of a strange, you know. The uh, whole Northeast, but. I mean, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Camille Rivera, and I'm from Queens College. Um, my question is that um, we were, we've been talking a lot about 1199, and, and they've obviously become a very powerful machine in New York City politics. Um, they, they, you know, uh, endorsed uh, rabbits, I believe, in the New York State Assembly um, elections and the special elections in Manhattan. Um, and now I think that they, I, it could be wrong, they've just endorsed Governor Pataki as well. Right, right. Um, this is going to be, I, I'm sure it's a huge split between the unions now. I mean, he struck, he struck a deal with the health care, the health care deal, which allowed him to get more raises for his employees. Um, my question is, though, how do you think it's going to go towards the other unions? Do you think that the unions are going to do the same follow suit and start, um, you know, endorsing the, not the Democrats anymore, but Republican candidates that they can strike deals with? And do you think it's going to uh, strike a big gap between 1199 and other unions like DC 37 and U UFT. You know, I had a call from a reporter a couple of weeks ago when the New York City sanitation workers endorsed Pataki. What did I think it meant and what was the deal? And obviously New York City sanitation workers don't get anything from governors of New York. Uh, I think Pataki is going to enjoy support from labor locals and municipal unions all over the state. Uh, and a lot of them that were typically Democratic unions. I think there's several things. He's doing a good job as governor, in their opinion. He's going to win. I think that's a critical opinion. factor right there. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and I think you know, they're going to they're gonna spend a lot of time uh, supporting a winner who's done stuff for them in the past. Uh, you know, and I, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. It's not just 1199. Uh, the, you know, the question, of course, is that 1199 has endorsed <laughs> Um, has and has endorsed Governor Pataki for a lot of the members of 1199. As you know, frankly, I you know I I grew up in a housing project in Brooklyn. If you voted for a Republican, your hand was going to fall off. You you would you know like I don't even know if they had the lever on the machine. Uh, do, you know, <laughs> does the membership automatically follow well, what well, the union well, leadership I mean, says? Well, Dennis was talking about uh, creating his own uh, political party, 
<laughs> uh, Labor Party because he, he didn't he figured his members weren't going to go to the Republican line and, and pull the lever. And he, I understand he dropped that idea. But I, I think that's that's a, a, a real dilemma because I, I think what's happening with the labor movement is just that it's all over the place. I mean, last year they were hedging their bets during the Democratic primary. Uh, this year, I mean, they're just, they're just all over the place. And I, I don't know, you know, there's no coherence there, uh, ideological coherence. And I think there's been, there's been really a real loosening of the ties with the Democratic Party. And that's what I mean that I think we're kind of at a crossroads in a lot of different air, levels. And, and that's one of them where I. And I well, and a lot of those Democratic voters who would feel their hand would wither. We've elected Republican mayors three times, mm -hmm. and for the first time ever, had a Republican mayor succeed another Republican mayor. I think all bets are off in the but, future. But the other candidates, though, the other thing that we always because we always focus on the top, the top office. But you're also right; you're also endorsing Democrats up right. and down the line as well. So you know, there's there's a, an attempt to you know mix things well, up how, a little bit. It's not like a total surrender to the Republicans. You know, pardon me for introducing substance into a discussion of politics, no, but. No. Um, <laughs> but you know that kind of wheeling and dealing that you know that parties are now up for that the unions are now up for grabs. The argument that you've seen in kind of um, uh, in in the African American community in, in in Calvin Butts and Floyd Fleck that they want the African American community to be somewhat up for grabs. Right. They want to be wooed. They don't want to be taken for granted. That you can perhaps parlay that into something. And the fact is that the Republicans in New York are not kind of ideological right wingers who are who are inherently hostile, you know, to the to the interest of poorer people in the way you might find, you know, in the South and in, in California and Texas. So maybe it's kind of a rational development. Well, well and, and also, I mean, isn't the overall statewide registration, I mean, I know in New York it's, it's five to three Democrats, Republicans, but overall statewide, isn't it five to four Democrats, Republicans? I don't know. Well, it's at more you. than five, it's like five to one registration. I mean, five to one in right. right. I think I think statewide it's five to four or five to three with this motor voter thing where you can register to vote when you renew your driver's license, when you get a welfare benefit. I think it's become increasingly Democratic, so it's, it's absolutely in their own self-interest for re Republicans running for statewide office in New York cannot even if every Republican who was registered to vote voted for them, if nobody else voted for them, they wouldn't win. That's right. It's, it's just a numerical, you know, it, it's, must it, be this it, way. And it's really, so therefore they have to do things yeah. to make Democrats want to come to well, them. Well, it's really strange times. I mean, I actually had somebody from uh, the Pataki camp approach me uh, and took me to, uh, I think it was the Yale Club or something. And I, he went to Yale. <laughs> and uh, it was another, another guy. Although he didn't learn anything about E.B. White there. I, I just want <laughs> to point that out. You don't get a very good education yeah. at Yale, so don't worry no, about I, it, guys. And <laughs> I learned about it at Brooklyn College. But, but, but see? It was, see that? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> but it was, it was strange. It was a guy sitting me down. I mean, I hate all politicians. You know, that's my politics. And, and the guy's telling me uh, that they, they, you know, Pataki's <laughs> interested in getting a Hispanic to run against Spitzer. You know, and I'm like, might as well. You know, do I do I, do, I, do, I, do I know some names? No, oh. I mean, not me. And I'm like, I, you know, I don't know. You know, but it was the strangest kind of conversation that I never would have had like uh, four or five years ago. I Did mean, they ask like, for a quality person or they ask for a Hispanic. Listen, man, I was just eating, <laughs> getting that free lunch you know, down and uh, like, yeah, you know, whatever. You know, that, that was basically it. Was the food good? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Hi, uh, Donata Blexer from Brooklyn College. Following September 11th, we've seen a tremendous increase in the support for the Republican Party. Uh, how much uh, is this election going to be influenced by that Republican sentiment? Have you seen support for the Republican Party? You've seen support for the president, and for the governor, and for Mayor Giuliani? That's rally around the flag stuff. You're right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, you know, I'm not so sure how much of that translates into support for the Republican Party, as it is for, you know, I mean, there's a sense of rallying around the president in the aftermath of, uh, of September 11th. And despite, you know, I think Cuomo's code holding comment, I think there's been a, there was certainly a rallying around Mayor Giuliani, who was on his way to a very depressing yeah. end of his administration. Yeah. He emerged as a hero. And um, so, I, you know, I'm not so sure that that, I mean, you know, one of the questions is to what degree is September 11th going to resonate politically? We talked about how Pataki's $54 billion gambit kind of withered on the vine, that Cuomo has tried to take a shot at Pataki on September 11th, and it seems to have boomeranged on him. To what degree is September 11th still 
too too raw and sensitive and powerful. I, I think you politicize it at your peril. I mean, I think that's what. Except that this is a political them. campaign, and why can't and there was is it off the table for discussion? I think it is. Yeah. I think people do not. I think people are just going to say that's cheap. Don't go right. there. It, you know, all these people died. I'm still depressed about it. I don't want to hear politicians fighting about it. Just don't talk about it. I think yeah. people just get really upset when people take yeah. that stuff, which is sacred ground yeah. in our minds it's, now it's, and, and it's going to be really foremost in people's minds you know at primary time because it is september 10th when the primary is you know and there'll be all this hoopla around one year since and the healing and all of this stuff you got another thing going on it's not just rally around the flag it's not just troops are in afghanistan and there's problems in israel democrats haven't been able to get traction since 9 11 because of all the stuff Issues haven't been uh, available to them. Uh, everything on the news, I, I was chatting with a guy uh, from Fox Cable, and he made a comment that I hadn't been a guest on their channel in, in months and months. And he said, that'll maybe change as we get closer to the election. And the reason was wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the war, wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the Israeli issues. Mm -hmm. So political figures and campaign issues haven't been covered. Uh, you've got a situation nationally, wherever you look, Democratic candidates aren't raising as much money. Republicans are doing better. Incumbents are doing much better. Uh, it's harder to be partisan. Uh, there aren't issues that are getting, you know, you Except wake up one day Joe, and Enron right? looks like it's going to be good, then it goes away. Except, Joe, even, even, even last year, you know, the primary was September 11th. The, the second primary, the, the postponed primary, was September 25th, and we were all still in a daze. Um, by the time the runoff happened on October 11th, there was a lot of attention on politics. Politics was pushing itself, if not onto the front page, certainly a lot closer in the paper. Yeah, but candidates the never really got, got flushed out. And, but, by the, but by the time we got to November, in the November election, we were, you know, we had a nice slug it out mayoral election that was getting a lot of coverage on the, you know, on the front pages. I mean, this is... Not the, far by, no, so, I I mean, that, so I'm just saying that, you know, the degree to which there is a sense of normalcy in, in the kind of obnoxious politics that we take as that we yeah, get but right, as normal. Right now, McCall and Cuomo aren't getting the kind of coverage they would have gotten had this stuff not happened. Uh, neither one of them are able to state a case for why they want to beat Pataki. Neither one of them are able to get traction on issues on what Pataki's done wrong. Uh, and, and neither one of them has flushed themselves out as figures. Carl McCall is one of the most substantial figures in New York politics, and he's going through already, we're, in, we're in, into May, and people barely know who he is well, as that's, a figure. That, that's true. Uh, that's true. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kiani Bria from Lehman College. Um, considering all the cuts to education and Governor Pisaki's ridiculous plan for the TAP program. Um, for the TAP program. Yeah, the tuition, tuition assistance, tuition program. assistance program. program. What route, if any, do you think the Democratic um, candidate will take in challenging him on his position in education? You know, it's funny. I, um, I was at a Democratic Party uh, panel a couple of months ago and I asked a couple of people from the, from the party state party people so what are your issues against governor Pataki and this woman looked at me and said education 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 and I said okay I'm ready I'm ready to hear about education 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 I've been listening and I haven't heard anything so I mean I think I think the young lady raises an interesting point I think there may be things there that voters are not aware about certainly I I couldn't speak on those issues, the ups and downs of them. I think the candidates, you know, the Democratic candidates, it's up to them kind of bring this stuff out and uh, let us hear about it. On the other hand, you know, I have a kid in public school, and I can tell you when I'm mad about something happening in the public school, it's not the governor that I'm going to blame. <laughs> so, I mean, I think you could, you know, probably a good Democratic candidate could come out and, and raise some of these education issues regarding Pataki. Will it resonate with the voters in terms of something that they would be willing to hold the governor responsible for problems in their local schools? Maybe, maybe well, Beth, not. That's, but that's one of the phenomena of being in New York City. We are virtually a creation of New York State. They, you know, they could vote us out of existence tomorrow <laughs> if they wanted to. We, you know, we have virtually so such limited home rule power. Yeah, but that's but, standard. But because they were 150 miles north, we just don't focus on them. And I say that, you know, I mean, as a former reporter, it's just, you know, I think that the coverage of Albany is woefully inadequate 
in terms of its power over 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 our lives. But I mean, the tuition assistance program, whether part-time students are going to be eligible to to uh, receive any kind of any kind of assistance where they've been pushed out of it. I mean, these are control the, of the board of ed by the uh, mayor or not. Well, that, well, well, that's, but, but, but the truth is, it comes, issues, comes even, down to it. The Democratic candidates have failed to make a case. Well, it's I mean, still it's up to them. I mean, to right, make right, the right, case. Yes, it's only you know it's May. <laughs> you know, they've got the because last number. Because Arthur Gray was pretty <laughs> far, far along. But because we, have no, because we have no primary on the Republican side, and we do have a primary on the Democratic side, are there any identifiable, significant issue differences between Andrew Cuomo and Carl McCall? And I don't believe that there are. And so, to, you know, I mean, to, this debate is not going to happen within a Democratic context. So it may not happen until after the Democratic but it primary, may happen is what after you're the, saying. That's a fair the point, actually. The Democratic primary seems to be, I'm a better person than he is or on each I side. Can, or I can do, yeah. I have a better yeah. chance of beating Pataki. Yeah. And, and, and right. which as a matter of fact, Bob, I mean, you've covered a lot of politics. That's usually the, the big issue. You know, name the last ideological issue that made a big difference, you know, in anything, even presidential stuff. You know, Bush yells about Social Security as we can yell about it all he wants. It's not going to change. Yeah, and, and also you're getting mixed, again, mixed signals in terms of the educational system, whether it's CUNY or the Board of Ed. You know, every day there's an article about some horror story uh, within the school system or some big bureaucratic snafu or misuse of funding or uncertified teachers or uh, CUNY. We cut CUNY and look, uh, things are getting better when you can give them less money because there are more students applying and there's more diversity. You know, you start getting... You know, if you're, the, if you're not really invested in the issue, let's say if you're a CUNY student, you know, well, most people, what the hell's TAP? You know, what is it? Dance? <laughs> right. you know, yeah. dance? So what, what happens is, you know, you're invested in, and you could see yeah. the implications of what, what's going on very directly. But for the general voter, it's like, you know, it's, uh, Jesus, you know, I, well, put more money into what? You know, uh, you know so, so it's... Well, it, on the it's, schools, the local schools, of course, which is a different issue. Well, what's that proverb, you know, the worst thing is not to get what you want, and the second right. worst thing right. is to get what you want. <laughs> I think Bloomberg's going to get it, or at least he's going to get a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have to see. But on, but on the CUNY thing, I think you're exactly right. You know, you look at the, the, the general public, they see, you know, Bush giving Governor's Island to the city and, and the governor and the mayor getting together to build a new CUNY campus uh, and then to build high schools on other CUNY campuses. So it gets fogged up. Are they really not doing the right stuff for CUNY or are they really? Doing big time right stuff at CUNY. Where are the uh, if you know if we're if we're looking at this campaign as it moves ahead, we've already had a couple of major stumbling blocks. Where are the stumbling blocks? What are these uh, two at least the two Democratic candidates have to look out for? And I guess more importantly, what does Pataki have to look out for? What does he have to be concerned about? I think Pataki's got to worry about the economy. He's got to show some growth in the economy, and he's got to sh show some growth in state revenues. Cuomo's got to watch that he doesn't look like a, a brash, inexperienced person that's not mature enough for the job. And Carl McCall has got to, you know, he's got to make sure people get it, that he's a senior, substantial public figure who's done good by everybody. I mean, when you consider Carl McCall is the single, is the, uh, con controls more money on the market than anybody else, than any individual in the world. on the market in, in, <laughs> in, in the world as the sole Bill trustee Gates. of the, yeah. of the uh, state pension fund. There are other, there, I guess California has a larger pension fund, but they don't have a sole trustee. Carl McCall personally controls the investment of about $112 billion, or depending on what the value of that is particularly. What are the stumbling blocks? Well, you know, I just want, on McCall, the, you know, to the average voter, what the state controller does is a very sort of obscure and mysterious thing. Most people don't know what the state controller does, and they don't really care. Um, and before September 11th, you know, I'd heard McCall give a number of speeches, and in all of them, he's, he, his standard line was, you know, under my tenure as state controller, the state pension fund has grown from X billions of dollars to X billions of dollars. You know, and, and I, you know, we would always in the press corps be laughing like, oh, yeah, you're taking credit for, you know, the economic boom of the Clinton administration in the 90s. Like, Wall Street is why the state pension fund went out, not necessarily because of the brilliant stewardship of Carl McCall. But now he can't even say that because with the markets all down, you know, I mean, I put my kids' money into the state college savings fund, and there's less money in there now than there was when I put it in there. And there are probably a lot of other parents who the same thing has happened to them. There may also be, you know, teachers who've lost money in their pension funds and other, you know, state 
monitored uh, pension uh, situations. So to the simplistic-minded voter and the simplistic-minded reporter. Um, <laughs> All reporters are simplistic-minded. You know, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just saying that was his, his basic stump speech was, I've been a very effective steward of the state's finances, and he's going to have to find another way to 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 sell himself. I mean, you're saying that he he's an extremely competent and, well, he's, and he's been a UN ambassador, popular, a state legislator, a, a banker. I mean, he's, he's and not has your an amazing average personal candidate. story also right. to the tell, which I think yeah, is not very well known. I believe that he was, his mother was on welfare when he was a child. And, you know, I mean, he really, this is a really an amazing American story that he has to tell, as you say. And he it's hasn't not gotten been it out. fleshed out. It has yeah. not gotten out. Angela, where are the stumbling blocks? Well, a Andrew Cuomo, I think, is the only one who doesn't have a job. He's doing this full time, so he's got to be careful that you know he doesn't get obsessed and uh, you know kind of kill himself. He's a, also got to deal. A Cuomo get obsessed? Oh, okay, I take it back. And, and I think he's got to deal with that race card issue because I think that that that's going to be very. Uh, if, if the race stays real close, that's going to he's going to be salivating, and his people are going to uh, be tempted to deal with that. And the question is that what the legacy? Their legacies are going to be past this election. I mean, I imagine Cuomo plans to run for other things, so it'll be. Interesting to see if, if, if they can stop that cycle that we've had in terms of that race issue. And Pataki, like you said, I think that the issue is, you know, there are all sorts of signs that, that not all is well with the economy. Uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, revenue shortfalls, you know, things like that. And, and uh, <clears throat> it'll be interesting to see if, if some issues kind of emerge that just weren't there a few months ago. Uh, Mickey, one advice. joker is that uh, Joe is right and, and uh, everybody's right that it's the economy. That's the one thing you can't predict. Uh, and that is what could cause any one of them a lot of trouble. Um, Beth, I can't, with having, having read your book, The Girls, Your Girls in the Van. Should you hold it up again? I, I, I absolutely will. I absolutely, Sell that book. I absolutely that book. I, I, don't get any, I don't get any commission on this book. Um, uh, and I can't resist thinking that Andrew Cuomo got in trouble on the Pataki comment for something he said on the bus. And there's this strange dynamic of uh, yeah. being, You're you know, You're sitting I mean, there the, waiting. You've heard this speech 80 times before, and then all of a sudden, this person says something that they shouldn't have said. I mean, I, I wasn't there, obviously, that day, but I'm sure that there was a great deal of secret glee among the press corps. Oh, good, somebody made a terrible mistake. Well, unless he, unless he didn't make a mistake, and he was just trying to separate himself out. Um, is there something incredibly unhealthy about this? You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's just the nature of political reporting as it is done now. It's, you know, it's partly the way campaigns are run, so it's partly because of the way, you know, candidates present themselves to the public. And it's just partly the nature of the beast. I mean, you follow a candidate around for months and months. You hear them make the same speech a hundred times. You write the story once, maybe okay. twice, about where they stand on let an me, issue. But after you've written the story about where the candidate stands off, on though. anything... Well, let me cut you off because I've gotten the goodbye I'm sign. Sorry. And I have to obey the goodbye sign. I want to thank you all, and we will uh, see you next time on the CUNY Forum. Mm -hmm.